My name is Stefano Sandrini. I'm a senior solutions architect in Amazon Web Services, and I work in Europe with customers from the power and utilities industry. So let's have a look at um, what we're going to talk about in today's session. Um, we will have a quick look at smart meters use cases and trends uh, in the power and utilities uh, industry. We will then move to an overview of AWS services, both in the cloud and at the edge, that allows our customer to implement and address uh, smart meters use cases. And then we will have a dive deep on a higher level architecture, a proposed architecture, um, that, again, uh, enables our customer to address smart meters use cases and being data driven companies. The last part of the session will be about how to leverage machine learning uh, to get new business insights from the data that you have on your data lake. So let's start talking about how the business model is changing in this industry. So the power and utility industry business model over the last century was to generate electric power um, at the largest central location primarily through use of fossil fuels, hydro and nuclear, and then flow the energy in one direction and sell it to uh, ratepayers. However, in last years, what we have saw is the raise of the 3D, so decarbonization, the needs for companies to meet sustainability goals, uh, having less fossils and use more renewable energies, uh, decentralization, so having a more distributed source of energies. And digitalization, so adapting new technologies, adapting smart technologies in order to achieve, um, in order to meet, sorry, the higher customer expectation. And so these things drive to a new utility value chain uh, that is different from the previous one, is decentralized and it is distributed. And so to implement this new value chain and to meet all these new requirements, um, companies in the power and utilities industry are focusing on main areas. And I want to call out four of these main areas. The first one is customer engagement and insights. They need to reduce customer churn, improve customer satisfaction, and create new revenue streams. Then there is the focus on the IT transformation. Companies need to improve agility, reduce cost, and enable innovation across the IT function and the rest of the business. And in parallel, there is also the OT transformation, since companies have to achieve the highest level possible of operational excellence. Why? Well, because there is a huge amount of data coming due to the large adoption of IoT devices and smart devices. And so they need highest level possible of operational excellence. The last part is, the last focus is the needs to create more value from the existing physical assets and the workforce through the usage of analytics tools and machine learning. And so, Many companies are marching towards what is called the data-driven paradigm. They want to be data-driven companies. And this, together with the usage of smart technology, such as smart meters, um, enables a new set, a complete new set of scenarios and um, use case. For end users, they can increase the awareness on their consumption. They can have billing transparency. For retailers, retailers can enable new value-added services, and so finding new ways to propose new business and new offers. They also can enhance fraud detection systems. Maybe they already have in place some fraud detection solutions, but they can enhance these systems based on data coming from smart meters and smart technologies on the field. And finally, retailers can offer flexible rates. 
Again, based on analysis they can perform on data coming from the field. For network operators, network operators can enable advanced diagnostic. They can do predictive maintenance based on data coming from the field. And of course, they can do better network monitoring. And so, being a data-driven company for uh, a power and utility company uh, comes with challenges. Challenges from an architectural point of view. The first challenge is, of course, scalability. Due to the large amount of volume of data um, that is coming from the field, they need to scale fast and they need to be agile. They also need to reduce the effort for the administration and the deployment of their IT infrastructure. And again, this is related to achieve the highest level of operational excellence possible. Then, from an application point of view, from an application perspective, what we are seeing is a shift toward uh, the uses of a stateless pattern. And designing stateless application is important because, again, it enables company to scale better their infrastructure and their application, their workload. Also, they are following what is called the break the monolith path. So they are taking um, their legacy application, designed it as a monolith application, and they are moving towards uh, microservices-oriented applica application. So breaking their application into smaller parts. And again, this is important for scalability and achieving operational excellence. And this is true for several um, type of application, for processing application, aggregation application, analytics application. And also this is important for the integration aspect. So integration with third party application or other legacy systems. Uh, companies need to find a way to define a new pattern for application integration that can meet the scalability requirements that um, are facing. And finally, of course, being a data-driven company comes with the challenge of managing data. So companies have to um, understand how to collect and analyze a huge amount of heterogeneous data coming from the field. And so talking about heterogeneous data, huge amount of heterogeneous data, um, the pattern that a, a lot of companies are following is the usage of a data lake. So what a data lake is, it's basically a centralized repository that allows structured and unstructured data to be stored at any scale. An important thing is that data is stored as is. There's no need to first structure the data before saving it. And another important thing talking about data lake is that data lake support rapid ingestion, transformation, and consumption of data. And this, again, it's important due to the fact that we are using a lot of IoT and smart devices and a huge amount of volume of data coming from the field. So adopting a data lake um, design allows our customer to enable new use cases, um, real-time streaming analytics, data discovery on the data that they have in the data lake, uh, business intelligence, um, and usage of machine learning to get insights from these data. So now uh, we have seen some trends and some transformation that utility companies are having um, in these years. So let's see AWS services that can address smart meter use cases and then can support this transformation in the industry. So we just talked about data lakes and the first service that comes up in our minds, when we talk about data lakes, building data lakes on AWS is S3. S3 can act as a central storage, thanks to his scalability, um, he's secure, and it is highly cost effective. And then there are a set of other AWS services that can be used to complement the solution, and these services can be grouped uh, into categories. So the first category is the data ingestion. Uh, there are several services that can be used to perform data ingestion. I just want to call out Amazon Kinesis, Kinesis Data Streaming or Kinesis Data Firehose. We will see the usage of Amazon Kinesis in the proposed architecture in the coming slides. 
There are services that can be used to do catalog and search of data that you have in the data lake, such as AWS Glue or Amazon DynamoDB. There are services that can be used to expose data that you have in the data lake, uh, for example, through a REST API with Amazon API Gateway, or that can enable our customer to create real-time dashboard by using AWS AppSync. Of course, an important aspect is security and managing security and encryption, so Amazon KMS or CloudTrail to perform auditing on operation that has been done um, into the data lake. And the last category is about analytics. As you already know, there are several services uh, related to analytics, um, EMR, Amazon Athena, QuickSight. Um, I just want to mention Amazon Redshift, and we will see the usage of um, the adoption of Amazon Redshift in the proposed architecture. So by building a data lake um, on AWS for our customer uh, brings some benefits. The first is they can innovate faster, they can access data in a faster way, and so they can discover uh, faster new business opportunities, and they can understand new business challenges um, by analyzing the data. They can uh, do cost efficiency, thanks to the cost efficiency nature of Amazon S3. They can get scalability, again, thanks to the scalability of Amazon S3. And they can do, they can reach agility, and it's important, it's one of the goals and the challenges that we have just seen before. Uh, so they can, for example, decoupling the storage layer and the compute layer for the data lakes, and this gives our customer flexibility. And so again, they can reach operational excellence due to the flexibility. And again, security and compliance, of course, they have the benefit of um, being able to encrypt highly sensitive data and perform um, auditing and data lineage. Then there are other services that are important in smart meter use cases. Of course, there are services coming from the AWS IoT category. There are several services that can be used. Um, I just want to mention two of these services. The first one is AWS IoT Core, is a managed services, is a managed service, sorry. It's the backbone for IoT deployment in AWS. Uh, it lets connect devices um, easily and securely uh, with the cloud and also with other devices. Um, our customer can perform routing, uh, processing, and they can act upon data or messaging that are coming from the devices to the cloud. And also it's fully integrated with other AWS service, and so you can reason on top of the data that is coming from the field. The second service I would like to mention is IoT Greengrass. Um, AWS IoT Greengrass extends the capability of AWS IoT Core into your devices. So you can build business logic that runs directly on the device, and you can act locally on data that is generated by the device itself or a group of device. And so you can still take the advantage of using the cloud, but also the advantage of performing some business logic close to your data and in the edge. So now that we have seen uh, AWS services that enables or smart meter use cases, uh, we can move forward and have a look at a proposal architecture that is basically um, derived from interactions that I have with customer in this industry. And so it's based on a set of best practices and guidelines that comes from real interaction on real use cases. Of course, is uh, a general architecture uh, you have to manage uh, differences uh, from this general architecture to your use cases, to your specific use cases. But let's start with the first part. And the first part is, again, the field. Uh, we have to manage the ingestion um, of data coming from the field. And so we have at the edge what is called a substation gateway. A substation gateway is a component 
that is able to run AWS IoT Greengrass, so you can have business logic running at the edge. The substation gateway can collect data coming from meters, uh, different meters, and with different type of integration. You can have power line communication, for example, to get data from the meters. And then at some point, this business logic will perform some sort of aggregation, and they will send data to the cloud through MQTT, uh, interacting with AWS IoT Core. And this is important because in companies I work with, uh, previous use cases uh, were uh, related to a pool system. So uh, the on-prem application or the AWS cloud application that managed the acquisition part was pulling data from the edge. And so they had a different uh, rate of ingestion. So having a push method enables you to have a higher uh, frequency of ingestion, of data ingestion. And so if you have SLAs, for example, this is an important feature. Then um, in the cloud, there will be some business logic uh, based on AWS Lambda, so in a serverless fashion. Um, and this business logic will basically perform some sort of a, um, unpack of data coming. Um, and it will save data to Amazon S3 uh, in a bucket. So some design principles. Um, if you run, um, if you need to run some sort of aggregation um, on the edge by using Lambda function running on AWS uh, IoT Greengrass, it's important to aggregate small files or objects coming from meters uh, before sending the data to AWS IoT Core. Why? Well, because this uh, reduces the transaction cost and enables you to avoid um, throughput limits since you are using less number of requests per second. And this drives, of course, to having a network efficiency, a better network efficiency. The second important thing and principle uh, that I would like to mention is the use of application acknowledge coming from the cloud to the edge to manage the life cycle of these objects that are managed um, in the substation gateway. So basically, the business logic running on Lambda will send an acknowledge once the uh, data is stored in S3. And at the edge, you will have uh, Lambda listening in subscription to a specific MQTT topic that will be able to delete files, clean files, or do retry if no acknowledge has been received for some time. So moving forward, we have the ingestion from the field, and now we have the acquisition part and a processing part um, into the cloud. And so, as you can see, we split um, these two parts into separate parts um, because of some design principle that I would like to mention. First of all, you should always apply, when you design your architecture, uh, the well-architected framework. So for those of you who are not aware of what the well-architected framework is, is uh, a set of best practices and guidelines that provides uh, a consistent approach for customers and architects to implement design that can scale uh, over time. It's based on five pillars, operational excellence, security, reliability, performance, and cost optimization. So the decision that has been made when I designed this architecture was based on the well-architected framework, and you should do the same to address your specific use case. And so, for instance, the coupling, the acquisition and ingestion part from the processing part, it's important because then you can manage different rates and different scalability between the two steps. You may need a high scalability for the ingestion and acquisition part due to the high frequency of uh, data coming from the field. But then maybe you don't need this high scalability in the processing part. So then you can realize cost optimization while keep maintaining security, reliability, and performance. 
And how you can do that? You can do that by using queues that can act as buffers, basically, or you can use messaging services. So that's why you see some queues in the architecture, both in the specific acquisition part and in the, in the integration between acquisition and processing. Second important thing is having lean data at the edge and then enrich data in the cloud. This again drives to efficient transmission, efficient storage uh, at the edge in the substation gateway. Then you can enrich if you need to enrich some data uh, while you read, so in the acquisition step or in the process step. And so you can separate S3 buckets from the ingestion bucket and the processing data bucket. So talking about buffers um, to perform the couplings, um, you basically have two options. The first one is using Amazon Kinesis data streams. And that's interesting because it's basically a seamless way to bridge um, MQTT with your application. Uh, you have to be aware that you need to calculate numbers of shards and the batch sizing uh, to match the scalability that you need. And if you have some SLA or there's some latency, a maximum latency that you can afford, you can start from that and work backwards to define the proper batch sizing and the proper number of shards. And also, you can do resharding, um, but you have to do it on your own. The second option is using Amazon SQS uh, to decouple the systems and decouple layers. In an event-driven fashion, you can leverage the full integration between Amazon SQS and AWS Lambda. Uh, AWS Lambda can pull messages from um, the queue, from the SQS queue. And so you can leverage the out scaling nature of SQS and Lambda. And then you can use this um, combination of SQS and Lambda to, have, to minimize latency. Okay. And so this second solution can provide a cost-effective solution for highly scalable system. There's also some uh, design variation that you can apply uh, to this part. You can do fan out if you want. So you can separate uh, business logic for the acquisition part or enrichment part, if you do enrichment in the acquisition part, and the acknowledge part. So you have a parallel um, processing of two lambda running at the same time. That's why it's a fan out. Um, you have to be aware that you may encounter some additional cost since you have two lambdas running uh, instead of one. Uh, it depends on execution time and memory configuration that you apply to Lambda, but it may happen. Um, and another important thing is that the acknowledge that you send in this case, so in the fanout case, is not related to the direct ingestion into the S3 bucket since you're running in parallel from the acquisition part. So if you still want to separate the business logic for the acknowledge part and the acquisition part, but you need a direct relation between the acknowledge and the ingestion to S3. You can run the acknowledge part um, triggered by the S3 put object event. So once the object is stored in the S3 bucket, a second Lambda function will be triggered and it will send the acknowledge part, the acknowledge message to, to the edge. So again, um, in this way you can separate the logic uh, you have to understand that the knowledge will be per object saved in S3, which may be different from the object that you have at the edge. So when you want to manage the life cycle with this kind of knowledge, you have to do some business logic at the edge to match um, the knowledge part and the objects that you have on your substation gateway. So moving forward, um, now that we have done the acquisition part and then we have data in S3 uh, as a raw data, we can then move to the processing part. And what we can use, again, is use 
SQS as a buffer, as an integration pattern between the two steps, having some business logic for processing part uh, in Lambda. And of course, this is a general design. You have then to tailor your architecture based on your specific use case. Um, and then if you want to integrate and if you want to send this processed data to external system, legacy application, or other company's branch application, you can then use, again, Amazon SQS as an integration pattern for external system. Then you will save your data into S3 in another bucket, a processed, staged data bucket. And so again, some other design principles. Uh, you can separate uh, buckets for raw data from buckets that contains the processed data, then can act as the real data lake if you do processing. So you can uh, preserve, anyway, raw assets uh, into the raw data bucket, and you can potentially lifecycle uh, these data to Glacier, and then having the real data that forms the data lake into the processed data bucket. Lambda, Lambda again, pulls Amazon SQS. You can process batch of messages uh, for a single execution, so you can fine tune how many messages can you process with um, AWS Lambda in order to, met, to meet your requirements. And then an interesting part, you can use and we have seen customers using DynamoDB as the data store for processing purpose. So basically, if, for example, you are processing um, loading profiles, load profiles, and then maybe for this process you need to um, use some data from the last two months, for example, what you can do is you can store this data into DynamoDB use this data while processing uh, with Lambda, and then apply a TTL, a time to leave. And so in this way, DynamoDB will flash out, will delete uh, older items, items older than two months. So you can manage this type of scenario basically automatically by using feature of DynamoDB. And that's really effective and efficient. Once you have data, in your uh, data lake bucket, usually companies want to perform some uh, sort of reporting um, or they want to present data in the data lake to business users. And many customers use Amazon Redshift to do that, uh, leveraging a feature that is called Amazon Redshift Spectrum that enables them to read data directly from S3 uh, into Redshift. Another important use case is to do some sort of data science on data that you have on Data Lake. And given the serverless fashion that we are presenting, um, one of the solutions that I would like to, to mention is uh, companies that are using Amazon Athena to do what? To do direct query uh, into data that is stored in S3. So again, no infrastructure to manage to do this part. So um, now we have data into the data lake. We have managed a way to meet uh, the rate of data ingestion, uh, the frequency of data ingestion, and we managed to address our use case uh, using serverless services, so no infrastructure to manage and high scalability, so we can match the requirements from the IoT transformation and OT transformation that I mentioned at the beginning. Now what we can do is we can turn uh, smart meters data into insights and get some business value out of it. How we can do that? Well, we can leverage um, machine learning. And using machine learning enables companies to perform and to create and to implement uh, different use cases. Uh, I would like to mention three. Predictive maintenance, an important topic in this industry. Um, consumption profile and forecasting. And anomaly detection. 
And so while machine learning can provide tremendous business value, it's also hard and it comes with many challenges. Um, why? Because collecting, cleaning, formatting, uh, training data set to train your models can be time consuming. And also once you have trained data, you need to be sure that your algorithms and your infrastructure will scale <coughs> accordingly with the volume of data that you have. And again, rate of request for inference and for forecasting that you have. And also for deployment it comes with, uh, with challenges because it can happen that teams that develop the model and do the training of the model is different from the team that needs to manage the deployment. So there are some challenges. And as you probably already know, we have this uh, service. It's called Amazon SageMaker. It helps you to upload uh, part of these tasks and these challenges to the service itself. Um, you can do build, train, and deploy of your model. You can use built-in high-performance algorithms. You can do one-click uh, training. You can do one-click tuning of your model. You can do model optimization. And you can do one-click de deployment. And you can choose between different kind of deployment. You can have managed hosting or other kind of deployment. And you can also use uh, very popular framework for machine learning as well. So TensorFlow, MXNet, and others. So talking about um, building machine learning models um, on top of data that you have in the data lake, well, you can do it different fashion, several fashion, uh, numbers of way. Your own device. You can use Cloud9. Uh, you can use an EC2 instance. But one of the most convenient way is using um, SageMaker notebook instances. Uh, these are fully managed uh, Jupyter notebook instances in the cloud. Uh, they come with uh, multiple built-in kernels. But you can also install um, external libraries or um, external kernels if you want and if you need. It integrates uh, with Git for version control, as well as for collaboration, sharing between uh, teams or between developers. And it also comes with sample notebooks. So you don't have to start from scratch building your model. You can start from existing notebooks and then modifying these this models that comes with SageMaker. For the training part, um, as I said, you have a one-click deployment uh, training option in the console. You can launch training jobs in the console, or you can use API or SDK. And again, this is important. It's just a feature. It's not just a feature. Uh, why it's important? Because it enables companies and our customer again to achieve operational excellence, since you can automate training jobs. And so talking about how to model um, machine learning model, how to build machine learning models, and how to train machine learning models, you basically have four options. Using built-in algorithms, and let SageMaker take care of um, the training and the deployment of these models. You can use some custom scripts uh, based on supported frameworks. Uh, as I said, Apache, MXNet, TensorFlow, PyTorch are some of the uh, supported frameworks. So you can use these frameworks to create, create your own custom scripts. You can bring your own, uh, your own algorithm or framework. So basically, you can provide SageMaker with your own Docker container, with um, your own algorithm and your own framework if you prefer. Uh, a framework that is not supported. You can do that in this way. And then again, you will have some custom scripts to do the uh, training of the model. 
and then SageMaker will take care of the deployment of the model itself. The last option is uh, subscribing to algorithms and models that are provided by third-party vendors in the marketplace. And then again, you can do training with SageMaker of these models and deploy the model um, with SageMaker. And so in our reference architecture, in our um, high-level architecture, um, this is where my, um, Amazon SageMaker uh, sits. So after the processing part, you have data saved in your data lake, and then you can use data in your data lake to train the model with Amazon SageMaker. There's a deep integration between Amazon SageMaker and Amazon S3, and so having data in S3 is a key uh, value. So once you have trained your model, then you have your model uh, available in SageMaker or in Amazon S3 as well, and you can use your model to do prediction, to perform inference, uh, depends on the use case. Talking about inference, um, with Amazon SageMaker, you have uh, several options, hosting services. You can do batch transform, you can do elastic inference, and you can, do, um, you can use Neo. We are going to have a look at these options. Starting with Amazon SageMaker hosting. So it's a hosting service. It's fully managed, so no infrastructure to, to manage. It provides a um, secure HTTPS endpoint that you can uh, request and have the inference as an answer. Okay? It provides high availability. It provides auto-scaling and also enables um, A-B testing. So you can use multiple version of the model and do A-B testing and, have, and compare inferences. You can do batch transfer as well. So this is important if you want to do prediction on your entire data set. So basically, even your entire data lake. And so how to do that? Well, you can use, uh, thanks to batch transfer, um, you can use transient resources. So you can start instances automatically. SageMaker will perform uh, the prediction, and then it will terminate uh, the infrastructure once the job is done. Okay? Again, I want no infrastructure to manage. It's fully managed. One last thing I want to mention is Amazon SageMaker Neo. Why it is important? Well, it is important because with Neo, which is a feature of Amazon SageMaker, you can compile your model for a specific target platform. And so if you want to perform inference at the edge, for instance, that's important because you can optimize your model for a specific target platform and have better performance. If you have many target platforms, this is important because you can then optimize for all of these platforms and do not have to deal with trade-offs between platform requirements and platform specification. So um, coming back to the smart meter use case and our architecture, um, there are some options to perform the inference um, on data coming from the field through AWS IoT. Um, basically, four options. Using Amazon SageMaker hosting, and we will invoke Amazon SageMaker hosting, the Amazon SageMaker hosting endpoint directly from the device if the device can support HTTP, or through AWS IoT Core that can trigger a Lambda, and then the Lambda will invoke AWS SageMaker, Amazon SageMaker endpoint. The second option is similar to the last one, but basically you have the model deployed and packed um, in the Lambda package, so it's deployed together with Lambda. So again, it's invoked through uh, an MQTT request. AWS IoT Core will trigger the Lambda, and the Lambda will perform the inference using the model. The other two option is performing inference at the edge. And so performing inference at the edge, you can use Greengrass. So you can use models that are deployed in S3 
or in SageMaker and then use Greengrass to perform the inference. Or you can do inference at the edge by using custom code. So the model and some sort of application code is pre-provisioned by the manufacturer, basically, on the device, and is shipped together with the device. And then, of course, you have to manage your own uh, update system, over the update, for example. And so in our architecture, uh, how does it look, the cloud inference with Amazon SageMaker hosting? So basically, again, you have data coming from meters. You want to do some inference based on this data. You have uh, a business logic with a Lambda function running on AWS IoT Greengrass. It performs a request through MQTT to AWS IoT Core. And then AWS IoT Core, based on a rule, um, will trigger the Lambda function, and the Lambda function will call the Amazon SageMaker endpoint. And then you have the inference, and you can do um, whatever you have to do with the inference. When to use um, this approach? Well, for sure, when devices are not powerful enough to perform uh, local inference, since we are using uh, the cloud. When models can not be easily deployed to devices, so it's hard, for example, to do over-the-air update to the substation gateway or a smart device, so you can't rely on updates or you cannot provide a device with a pre-built model. So you use Amazon SageMaker hosting. And also, uh, another important aspect, when you want or when you need additional cloud-based data to perform prediction. So you have to rely on the cloud side. You cannot perform inference at the edge. Requirements for this specific part, network has to be available and reliable. And if you want to directly invoke uh, the HTTPS endpoint from the device, the device, of course, has to support HTTP protocol. So when to use uh, the cloud inference with Lambda, which is some sort of variation of the first um, case? Um, well, basically, as we said, you train the model usage maker, you host it in S3, or you can embed it in Lambda, and then Lambda is triggered by uh, AWS IoT. And you use this when you cannot do local inference, and you cannot do um, HTTP. So you cannot directly invoke the HTTP endpoint of SageMaker. Also, when cost must be kept as low as possible, since you are using Lambda to perform inference, so you do not have, you, you don't pay the managed infrastructure for SageMaker endpoint. Again, requirements. Um, Network must be available and reliable, even if MQTT is less demanding than HTTP. And devices must be provisioned in AWS IoT. Last part, um, how to do edge inference. Ed edge inference with AWS IoT Greengrass, for example. Well, basically, you have data in your data lake. You can train your model in Amazon SageMaker. You can also bring your own model with Docker containers. Once you have the models, you can write a Lambda function that performs the prediction. And once you have the Lambda function that performs the prediction, you can add the Lambda function and the model to a Greengrass group. And then you let Greengrass handle deployment of Lambda function and the model and updates. And so what you have basically is that you have a second Lambda function. I call uh, it uh, inference handler that you can invoke at the edge again through AWS IoT Greengrass. And so you can act upon data coming from the field directly into the substation gateway. And you can perform inference into the substation gateway. And this is important because uh, 
maybe you need near real time predictions. So you don't want to rely on network. You don't want to rely on the cloud infrastructure. You, you need near real time. You need to do it at the edge. When to do this approach again? Well, when you want the same programming model in the cloud at, at the edge, why I'm talking about the same programming model? But, well, because we are using Lambda function both in the cloud and at the edge. So you basically use the same paradigm, programming paradigm um, in the cloud and at the edge. When code and models need to be updated, even if network connectivity is infrequent or unreliable. And if you use Greengrass, you can let Greengrass handle these issues and these challenges for you. It will be Greengrass that will handle uh, network issues um, or uh, a network connectivity that is unreliable. So you can offload this task to the Greengrass. And also, if one device in a group should be able to perform prediction on behalf of other devices. And that's because, uh, as we have seen in the previous slides, um, with AWS, IoT, and Greengrass, devices can interact with each other. So if you have one central device, one central substation gateway, they need to perform um, inference at the edge, but based on data coming from also from other substation gateway, you can do it with Greengrass. Requirements for this part. Uh, of course, devices must be powerful enough to run AWS IoT in Greengrass. There are some hardware requirements that you can check in the public page in the documentation for Greengrass. So you can do it, but um, you need to, to, to match the hardware requirements. And again, devices must be provisioned in AWS IoT. So it can manage certificates, can manage keys, and so on. The last option is do the, the inference uh, at the edge with your custom code. And with your custom code, you can also do the inference with models that are trained in SageMaker. You can build your model, you can train the model, and then you can put your model into the device, in the, um, into the device itself before shipping the device. You can have the, the model uh, ship it in this way. Um, you can and you have to bring your own application code, again, um, since we do not have Greengrass managing uh, triggering lambdas and, and, and other piece of, of software. So you have to write your own application code. And again, provision devices and manufacturing time. Or you can use your own update mechanism. Uh, again, an over-the-air update uh, or some sort of other mechanism. Um, when to use this approach? Well, when you do not want or you can't rely on cloud services, maybe you are uh, in a place where there's no network connectivity. Uh, we have customers that have this issue in, in forest, in, in uh, places where there's no network connectivity. So how can you do that? You bring your own model with a device. Uh, requirements, again. The viruses must be powerful enough to run the local inference. Different uh, hardware requirements from the SageMaker, of course. It depends on your technology stack, of course. And so, to wrap up what we have seen, we have seen some use cases. We have seen some trends. Um, we had a look at how AWS services can address some of these use cases. We had a look at uh, higher level architecture that can manage ingestion of data coming from the fields in a push fashion rather than in a pool fashion. We manage how to decouple and how to have a better scalability and highest operational excellence um, in the cloud by decoupling the acquisition part from the processing part. And then we had a look at how to use machine learning to get insights from data that are stored, that is stored in, in S3. Um, 
There was some uh, chalk talk uh, on Monday uh, that are related more or less to, to this topic. So if you had the chance to, to, to attend this, this chalk talk, I think that you can find um, some, some, some other information coming also from, from these chalk talks uh, that some colleagues uh, delivered. And um, I would like to thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for attending this session. Um, if you have any questions, since we are running out of time, we can uh, have a chat right after um, the exit uh, on, on the right. Um, please complete the session survey uh, in the mobile app. And please enjoy the rest of reInvent. Thank you. <laughs>